I trust you? The first thing I want you to do is to help me get on here, because even getting on here is not easy. If I just step on here, I will probably fall. Okay, so stand there, put your arm around my neck, support me strongly, yeah? Okay. All right, there we go. Now stay with me for a while. Okay, just stay there. All right. Now you give me a reasonable angular velocity, whatever you think is reasonable. I'll tell you if it's completely unreasonable. <laughs> give me a push. That's fine. Wow, did, is it fine? Now you walk a little bit away. If I fall, try to catch me. <laughs> okay, my arms go in now. My arms go out. My arms go in. My arms go out. Okay, now I'm completely dizzy now, this is no joke, so stop me, yeah? Just hold it. <laughs> no, just hold me, hold me. Okay, give my hand. Okay. Okay, you passed the course. Sacrifice for the sake of science. Oh, ah. all right, I've done worse. If we have a collection of many points, like we earlier discussed with um, momentum, points that interact with each other, it could be stars who gravitationally interact, it could be objects which are connected with springs, they have internal interactions which go on all the time. They bounce off each other. They collide. They break up in pieces. Internal friction, anything. Then, if I take two of these objects, if this one, for instance, is attracted towards this one, then action equals minus reaction, then these two forces are identical in magnitude. So if I take any point Q here, no matter where you choose it, that will never put a torque on that system, because the two forces cancel each other out. And so now we get the final conservation of angular momentum. It's all its glory if only we add here one little word external. The angular momentum of a system, this was angular momentum of just one object. This is the angular momentum of a system of many particles. They could be connected with springs. There could be chemical explosions going on. They could plow into each other. They could break each other up. The angular momentum will not change if there is no net external torque on that system, because all the internal torques, torques cancel out, because action equals minus reaction. So if we now compare conservation of angular momentum with conservation of momentum, then in the case of the conservation of momentum, remember, when we had a system of objects, in the absence of an external force on the system as a whole, a net external force, momentum was conserved. Now we have, with a system of particles, in the absence of a net external torque, angular momentum is conserved. In the case of the ice skater's delight, when you pull your arms in, the moment of inertia goes down, and so your frequency goes up. When a star shrinks, its radius goes down, its moment of inertia goes down, and therefore its angular velocity must go up. Moment of inertia goes with r squared. What determines the size of a star? If this is a star, then inside this star is a furnace, a nuclear furnace, nuclear fusion is going on. That produces heat and pressure, which wants to expand the star. On the other hand, there is gravity, which says, sorry, you can't do that, I want to hold you together. In fact, gravity would like to collapse the star. And nature finds a balance between the gravity and this pressure due to the nuclear furnace. 
Now, there comes a time that the nuclear furnace has been completely consumed. For our sun, that takes an additional five billion years. The sun has already been burning nuclear fuel for five billion years. It has another five billion to go. And once the nuclear fuel has been consumed, there are three end products of the dead star that is left over. And these three end products are the following. Number one, it's called a white dwarf. It has a radius approximately the same as the Earth, some 10,000 kilometers. And the mass of a white dwarf, there's a whole range of them. But the typical number, say, is half the mass of the sun. So that's one possible end product. This will be the fate of our sun, by the way. The density of such an object is quite high. Some 10 to the rho will be roughly 10 to the 6 grams per cubic centimeter. Another possibility is that you end up with a neutron star. A neutron star has a radius of about 10 kilometers, kilometers, and it has a mass of roughly 1.5 times the mass of the sun, and its density is about 10 to the 14 grams per cubic centimeter, which is even higher than the density of nuclei. And then there is a possibility, which is even more bizarre, that you end up with a black hole. I will not talk about black holes today, but I will get back to that later in 801. And a black hole, for all practical purposes, has no size at all. The mass of the black hole must be larger than, we think, three solar masses, and so the density is infinitely high. Whether you end up to be a white dwarf, a neutron star, or a black hole depends on the mass of the, of the progenitor, of the star that collapsed when the fuel, when the nuclear fuel was gone. And in order to form a neutron star, you would have to start off with a star of probably at least ten solar masses, maybe even more. So our sun will not become a neutron star, but our sun will ultimately become a white dwarf. Now, it would be a reasonable question to ask, why do you end up only with these three possibilities? Why is there nothing in between? Look, there is a huge difference from 10,000 kilometers to 10 kilometers. Is there nothing in between? And the answer to that lies in quantum mechanics, which is not part of this course, but you will see that in 805. Why there are only these two? And then if you get into general relativity, then you will understand why there is then this third very bizarre possibility. When a star collapses, two things happen. First of all, there is a huge amount of gravitational potential energy that is released in the form of kinetic energy. The stuff falls in, we call it gravitational collapse, and that gravitational potential energy converts to kinetic energy, and that ultimately converts to heat and to radiation. If I take an object here, a piece of chalk, and I drop that, that you can call gravitational collapse. Gravitational potential energy is converted to kinetic energy, and ultimately it goes to heat. Here we're talking about a star which is imploding, collapsing, and the amounts of gravitational potential energy that become available are enormous. In addition to this huge amount of energy release, the star must spin up because its moment of inertia goes down and therefore the angular velocity must go up. I want to do a little bit of quantitative work on this and I want to take an object like our sun and I would like to collapse that object from its present radius of the sun, which is about 700,000 kilometers. I want to collapse that to a neutron star with a radius of 10 kilometers, even though I know and I told you that the sun will not become a neutron star. It's just to get some feeling for the numbers. So we take an object like the sun, which has a radius of about 700,000 kilometers, and we're going to collapse that to a neutron star, which has a radius of about 10 kilometers. The mass of the sun is two times 10 to the 30 kilograms, 
And for those of you who are good at math, they can calculate when you collapse this object without losing any mass, you keep all the mass, but you shrink it to ten kilometers, how much gravitational potential energy is released, and that is a staggering number. And I call that delta U. It is a loss of gravitational potential energy, which is about ten to the forty-six joules. And this number is truly mind-boggling. This is converted to kinetic energy, and then it is converted to heat and all forms of radiation. To give you a feeling for how absurdly large this number is, if you take the sun and you take all the energy that the sun produces in its ten billion years that it will live, the total energy output of the sun is hundred times less than this number, and this comes out in a matter of seconds. So it is a mind-boggling idea that the sun is producing in ten billion years, the lifetime of the sun, it is producing less energy than what happens during a stellar collapse to a neutron star. Hundred times less. So when these infall occurs and this huge amount of energy is released, the outer layer bounces off the inner core and is expelled, and that's what we call a supernova explosion. The 